Hello and welcome to the world of Houdini. My name is Deborah Fowler. I want to go through a brief introduction of Houdini. Right now we're working in 180287 and we're excited about the new release. However, if you're new to Houdini, there are some concepts I want to cover first. To start with, we're in a desktop called the Build. We're going to be looking at some of the other desktops, in particular Solaris, which is the new one to Houdini 18. Another popular one that you will probably use is the technical desktop. For now, I'm going to leave it in the default. Right here you see a scene view, a network view, parameter view. Shelf tools are up here. I'm going to create a sphere using the shelf tool. So if I click on the sphere and hit enter, I get a sphere. Right now, I'm in the obj context. So Houdini has a concept of contexts. This will come into play later on. If I dive inside by double clicking, here I have the sphere node. This node is called a SOP node, or a surface operator. Again, re referencing the context that it is in. So once we have this, you'll notice that we can change the type, depending on our use. We can also change the parameters in here. So for example, if I wanted to change the radius, I can middle mouse click and I get the ladder control and I can change in small increments or very large increments, which makes it much easier to control. I can also revert to default. Now, if I wanted to play with this more, I could manipulate primitives and so on, just like you do in other 3D packages. However, what I want to focus on is procedural modeling. Let me show you some of the tools in Houdini that make that easier. Let's just start with a sphere and create a circle of spheres. I'm going to do this in multiple ways. It's really important to remember that there's many ways to do things in Houdini. Let me go ahead and create a copy to points node. I'm going to wire the sphere in, which if you float on these little round things, it says geometry to copy input one. This says target points to copy two. Okay, so if you're ever in doubt, you can always take a look at that or you can click on this question mark and what that does is it goes to whatever node you've selected. You click on this, it will give you floating help and in here it will describe what that node does. So that can be a very handy reference. What we're going to do now is create a circle and I'm going to wire this in and I happen to know that I need to change this to a polygon. You can see my spheres are way too big, so I could either increase the circle or decrease the sphere. And you can see now I have a circle of spheres. If I wanted more, I would change the divisions on my circle. And I would go in here and change this. And you can see now I have a circle of spheres. But one of the things that is bothersome is I have to click over to here and click over to here to make changes and that's kind of inconvenient, particularly if you were intending to make this into a tool. So what you can do is define your own parameters. Just like the sphere has a parameter to control the size, we can actually create top level parameters because it's easier for us to grab them from one place on the top. Okay, so if you look at this particular node, see this gearbox? gear icon. If you click on that, so I just clicked on this, edit parameter interface. What this does is brings up an interface for creating your own parameters. So for example, if I bring up say a floating point, let's bring up a couple of floating points. I can name these whatever I want. So for example, I could label this Kermit and call the parameter Kermit. So this is the label that I'll see in the window on my node. This is the actual parameter value. So if I hit apply, you can see I have Kermit. I have one that I haven't labeled yet. Kermit capital is my label. And the parameter when I float on here is called Kermit with a lowercase. Right now it doesn't do anything. I haven't set it up yet, but it is there. I can also go into the next tab and set a default value. So for example, let's do 0.5. Apply. Now, if I go over here, and revert this to default, you can see that that's going to be the value that Kermit takes. If I hit accept, it will disappear the dialog box. And 
what you can do now is use this. So let's just copy that parameter. And again, I'm right clicking, dive inside, and I'm going to have this control the scale of the sphere. So paste relative reference. So if we go back up, now you can see that Kermit is actually controlling the sides of those spheres. And we can change the label for this to change the number of spheres and so on. What I'd like to move on to is other ways of creating this. So there are many ways to speak with Houdini. Houdini is multilingual. So for example, we could create this with HScript, with Vex, with Vops, with Python. Let's just go through a couple of examples and then we want to move on to the next step, which is lighting and rendering. And that's where we'll start talking about some of the newer features. So starting with a new file, I'm just going to hit tab to create a sphere. I could have created it from the shelf tool. Either one's fine. I'm going to dive inside to my geometry context and I'm going to bring down a copy node. Rather than copy to points, I'm going to bring down copy stamp which was the original copy node. And what I'm going to do is create some HScript expressions. This is probably not the most popular way to do this. However, it's convenient to use this to show you some of the syntax for HScript. So if I turn off transform cumulative, I can type in expressions to put things exactly where I want them. You could think of the translate X value here, TX, as being assigned this expression, which I'm going to use the expression of a circle. So I'm going to create some radius, say 5, times the cosine of some angle, which I'm going to say 10. And then I'm going to multiply that by the number of copies that I have. Okay. I'm going to copy that expression. I'm going to paste that expression in here and change this to sign. And I'm going to create 36 of these. And you will see when I click display that I have, much like I did in the other example, I'm going to reduce this to half size, I have a circle of spheres. So again, this is another way to create that same thing. Let's just bring down a sphere again. <clears throat> and Let's go ahead and create this using a point wrangle. So I'm going to create a point wrangle to supply the points that I'm going to use in a copy to points node. And in this case, I'm going to use this point wrangle to create those points. So right now I have none, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this from points to detail to give me geometry. And I'm going to create a loop. And for those of you who have taken C++, this will look familiar. And again, you don't have to do this. There's no reason you have to use code, but for those of you who like to use code, it's great. I'm going to create a x value, which is going to be the radius times the cosine of the angle. Now in, in this one, it expects the angle to be in radians rather than degrees. So I'm going to do the same thing I was doing before, but now slightly different. And to save time, we can just copy and paste this. And then change this to Y. Change this to sign. And we're actually going to create a point. That's why I changed this to details only, so I could create geometry. I'm going to set my location to be a vector. And I'm going to set that to x, y, and 0. And I'm going to add a point, which is going to be geocell for 0, and then v at location. OK, and that gives me my point wrangle node. And again, we're going to change this to 0.5. Or we could change our circle to be 10. And you can see that now we have our circle of spheres, but using a point wrangle. Uh, let me just bring up the file so you can see some of the other methods. Um, this is the one we just went through. So just to give you an idea, there's my point wrangle node, same thing. 
Over here, you can see that I have some other iterations or examples. Um, in here, I have, let's just undo these. I have another way that I created it. In this case, I fed the point the points from a line into the point wrangle, and here is iterating over all the points. It's important to remember that a point wrangle, when it's set to points or primitives or whatever it might be, my attribute wrangle is running over all of the points and it's creating this expression. So it can do that parallel. This is very efficient. So what I'm doing here is manipulating these point attributes. So that's another concept I want to introduce, which is attributes. Attributes are just data that's being stored. So for this particular line, if I go to the geometry spreadsheet, I can see that the line, which has 36 points, has got values, nothing in X, nothing in Z, but in Y, they're slowly increasing. And if I change this length, of course, this is going to change those values. If I change the number of points, I will also change the number of attributes that I'm seeing. So I have only 20 now. Right? So let's go back to 36. And it doesn't really matter what length is because we're changing that inside our point wrangle. So when we go to our point wrangle, what we're doing is changing the positions of those points. So it's running through, it's essentially doing an implicit loop through those points. Whereas when we were doing the detailed view, we were doing an explicit loop. All right, here, we're just copying there onto that. And you can see there we have our circle of spheres. We can do the same thing with a pictorial view. So if you're not fond of code, you can actually do code blocks. So very much the same thing. And if we look at this enlarged, you can see that I'm taking a point number and I'm multiplying by the angle increment. I'm taking my radius, which is my parameter, and I'm multiplying those by my values of cosine and sine. And then ultimately, I'm hitting P, by the way, to uh, bring up the parameters for whatever node I happen to click on. And you can see here, what I'm doing is creating the cosine and sine, throwing that into a float to vector and outputting that to my point. So this is similar for those of you coming from an Unreal background to Blueprint. It is a pictorial version of what I was doing with VEX. So VOPS is the pictorial version of VEX. And of course, I could also do that without having to feed in geometry. Uh, you can do a detailed only once. You can see here it's compiling that VOP network into code underneath the hood. And here's a more interesting view where I'm actually using a for each loop. And if you want more information on that, there's another video which talks about different copies that you can take a look at as well. So I just wanted to introduce those briefly so you can get an idea of the different languages that Houdini speaks and also get an idea of how flexible Houdini is in that you can create things in many different ways. So before we move on to lighting and rendering, um, I want to talk a little bit about how to stay organized. So right now you're seeing some network boxes. Let me just get rid of those. Um, Relabeling your top level nodes is a good idea. You can lasso select and create network boxes. Uh, you can also create sticky notes. One feature that they've added recently to the sticky note is if I type something in here, I can also right click on the outside of my sticky and set the text size. So for example, if I want it larger, so that people aren't going to miss it, or if I'm doing a demonstration or something, I can make that so that it's really big. Uh, I can also create comments on a node, so I can edit comment, and in here, I can say this is my comment, whatever it might be. And then I can also click this, which will then display it. So sometimes you will see a little bubble there with no writing. It's because that hasn't been clicked, and you can always go in and edit your comment and change that, okay? So that can be very handy. The other thing that's very popular to organize is to simply color your node. So you select a node and change its color to red, indicating that's a very important node or what have you. You can also uh, color coordinate certain nodes and have them coordinated with uh, sticky. So for example, I could change the sticky note in here to being red as well. 
Um, so those are all different ways of staying organized. To get that color palette up, I just hit C. It's a hotkey. C toggles on and off. All right, so another way to stay organized is to use USD. So USD is a way of creating and organizing your files for layout, lighting, and look development and rendering. So right now, the two uh, in-house popular ways of rendering for Houdini 18 are Karma, which is their new CPU still, soon to be GPU, uh, Renderer, which re is replacing Mantra. But Mantra is also available. Right now, Karma is in beta, so I'm going to introduce both Mantra and Karma. So let's get started. First of all, I'm just going to create an object. So let's get rid of all this. I'm just going to lasso, select, and delete, and create a sphere. I'm going to dive inside, and I'm going to create also a grid. So how do I keep these two displayed? Hit a merge node, and that lets us display our grid along with our sphere. As you can see here, I have a grid. Let's turn off point display. So one of the first things I want to do is go in here and I'm going to grab this parameter by right-clicking, copy parameter, paste relative reference, so that the sphere is sitting on the grid. Okay, so this is a very common thing to do. Um, we do it all the time. If you want more information on that, uh, see my video on building snowmen. Okay, so to start, what, what I want to do is create a material for these. Now there's lots of different ways I could assign it. Uh, I go into my material palette and I'm just going to drag over a principal shader, which is a shader that can do pretty much anything, very generalized. And I'm going to apply that. There's a couple ways I could apply it. Now I could actually drag and drop. What that will do is apply it to the container node, which in here is right at the top here. That's usually not what I want to do because this shader is going to affect everything in that container then, and I want a specific shader for my sphere or my grid. So I'm going to get rid of that, dive back inside, and create a material node. So there's different places I could put this. I could put this to apply to the sphere, or I could put it at the bottom and assign it and create groups for these. I'm just going to, for the moment, put it right here, and I'm going to reference my principal shader. Okay. So that now has a shader assigned to it, just so that we can see it a little bit easier. Let's go ahead and assign it a green color. Now right now it's not displaying in my viewport, and the reason is because my sphere is a primitive. Let's just change that to polygon, and it's there. Now if I had rendered this, if I go into the render view and hit render, which is using mantra, it will indeed be there. It's just that it happens not to show up in the OpenGL view, which is your viewport view right now that I'm using. Okay, so there it is. All right, my material is on my sphere. If I wanted one on my grid, I could also put a material node down here, or as I said, I could create groups and um, have them assigned specifically in here with multiple materials. So if I plus this, I can put that in a group, and so on. This is giving me a warning. So node information, if I click on this, it's telling me but there's a mismatch of attributes, and that's because I have a material on here, so it has a shop material, but I don't have one on here. So if we look at our spreadsheet, you can see that for my material, for my sphere, I have a assignment of a shader. And if I middle mouse, same thing, you can see shop material. However, on the grid, if I go over here, I can see that I do not have any material assigned. I have point information, but I don't have any material. So if you look at this, you can see I have a point attribute, but I do not have a shop material path. And that is why it's giving me that objection. Okay? So it's good to be aware of those warnings. If you break something, let's go ahead and break something. Put a comma in there. You'll get a big red warning saying, this is broken. <laughs> it's not going to work. Okay. Now, we'll come back to that a little bit later on as well. Okay, so I have a sphere and a grid. So let's go ahead and create a material on that. So I'm just going to hold Alt and click. I could have also done Control C, Control V. Get rid of that second group and override 
a local variable. So in other words, I'm going to override the parameter base color. Instead of being green, I'm going to make that white. And now if we go into our render view, you'll see that what we get is a green sphere and a white grid. Not too surprising. Um, what I like to do is create my own Montreux Blender node. And you can see it threw me into the out context where my render nodes are for Montreux. This is going to be different for USD, so wait for it. Um, one thing that I would note is why am I rendering at 1280 by 720? That's the default. I can very quickly override that and work in a much more reasonable size. So let's change this over to Montra 1 and go ahead and render. And now you can see that it's at 320 by 180 and the time that I have to wait is a lot shorter. So that's a big plus. So there are lots of other things I could talk about regarding Montra. However, I'm sure what you're waiting for is Karma. So new USD and Karma. So let's go into the Solaris desktop, and in here, we're in the stage context. What I'm going to do is import my geometry, because you can see here that right now I have nothing. But if I look at my scene view, it is there. This is in the traditional context, but when I'm in Solaris, what I need is USD files or objects. So what I'm going to do is create a SOP import. So in here, I'm going to reference my sphere and load as reference. And if you look over at my scene graph, you can now see that the sphere is sitting in here. So I have a scene graph tree. I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing with my grid. And now I have my grid and my sphere in my scene. If I want to see them both at the same time, let's go ahead and merge. Merge is a little different. It is also creating merge style, so I have separate layers. So in here you can see I have my sphere and my mesh. I want to probably change this to sphere and grid just to keep things simple. And now I have two things. Right now it's in Beta Karma. I'm just going to turn that off to Houdini GL for the moment while I'm working. And I'll change this to camera and create a camera. And the easiest way to adjust my camera is to go in here and create my camera one. And then lock this. And I'm going to hit space G or space H actually. And unlock it. And then I have my camera. Um, next, I'm going to create some materials. So I create a material library node. And if I dive inside here, I can hit tab and create my shaders because I'm now in a different context. Let's do a classic one as well. So now I have a principal shader, classic shader. I'm going to change my principal one to a white color and my classic one to a green color. And now if I go up, you'll see that I have nothing in here yet, but if I hit autofill, what it does is it gives me those selections and I can either use a material assign node or I can do this right in here. So I can take my grid and assign that to principal shader. I can take my sphere and assign that there. And so now if I go into my karma view, you will see that I have a white uh, grid with a green sphere. Okay, let's add some lights. So lights are similar to Mantra. Um, what I have in here are cylinder, distant, disc, geometry point, rectangle, and sphere. So let's go ahead and create a distant light. And let's view that. You can see I have a distant light. I can either adjust it in here. So let's make that a little bit downward over this way, or I can use the manipulator in the viewport as well. Um, 
what I want to show you is how to blur that. So you'll notice that sun is missing. And that's because sunlight was a distant light with shadow blur. Let's go into Karma Beta. Go down here to Distant Blur. Set up Create. And then I'm going to blur this maybe 0.5. And you can see now I've got a blurry shadow. So that's really handy. I can also that set these controls. So you'll notice I've changed pixel samples to 2. Uh, they default at 128, which is going to take longer. So I just changed that to 2. So that my interactive render, which is actually my viewport, uh, is quite responsive. Uh, so for example, if I go in here and start changing the color of my sphere, you can see that I'm getting pretty much instantaneous results. So that's pretty cool. Okay, so now I have a light. Uh, let's go ahead and create a render, because that's great to have a preview, but what about a real render? So I'm going to create a karma node. A couple of things to know about the karma, karma node. One is that in order to get your file, you need to change this to sequence of EXR files. And that will give you the naming convention that is similar to Montrus. However, it does not re produce a render folder. So you have to do that mechanically. I've already done that as this file is saved as demo video. I'm going to go ahead and overwrite that. And so I've created a render folder in that directory. So in here, when I go to save to disk, it's going to save it in that folder. And I'm going to wait for that to render. Then I'm going to go into mPlay and then load disk files. And I can hear my computer, it's actually chugging away. And I'm going to go into render mode. And you can see there's my file. And if I bring this over to the viewport. You can see that I have my sphere node with a nice blurred shadow with penumbra, which is awesome. Okay, so the other thing that we have, let's just go ahead and create a dome light, which is the equivalent of your environment light. And we can go ahead and put a HDR in there. Let's go ahead to uh, our HDRs and do the garage. Okay, so now we have a dome light as well. And so you can see that that's really blowing out the scene. So let's go ahead and create a light mixer. And light mixer is super handy because what you can do is you can drag these over and then you have, uh, you can solo, you can disable lights, uh, lots, of, lots of different things you can do with these. You can also set, let's just move this down here a bit. You can uh, adjust the intensity and, sorry, the intensity and the uh, exposure uh, with little sliders. So you can see that here I'm adjusting the dome light to be brighter or less. In here I'm adjusting the key light and so on and so forth. So it allows you to easily change things. You can also do a sheet view where you're actually uh, typing in values as well. Um, these are all possibilities. So um, really, really handy. There's also a light linker, which I won't go into right now. But these are all things that you can do. If you want information on that, um, there's a section on my website in the overview on lighting for Karma. Um, so that's just a overview of Karma. Um, again, you have two choices. You can use Mantra or Karma in Houdini 18.0287. The intention is that, as you can see here, if I go into my viewers, you can see that um, legacy rendering, render view, that's where we were doing Mantra. In here, our view port is our in-progress render. So really, really handy, get quick results, and then you can render them for real out here. So that's about it for now. Um, there will be more information coming out on USDs in a follow-up video. Um, but for right now, I hope that you've enjoyed this, and uh, happy rendering.